guys, I'm Jerome. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about Kotlin and Android. Um, I work at invoice to go together with these two guys there. And we've been using Kotlin for the past six months to rewrite the Android app. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about like patterns that we found useful to kind of uh, build our app that might be of inspiration. Um, it's not like everything we use from Kotlin, uh, but it's just some, some things we used. And hopefully, they are useful to you guys. So uh, this slide actually contradicts exactly what I said on my previous slide, uh, because we don't only use Kotlin. Um, we have a lot of JavaScript as well, which we use to kind of um, share code between iOS and web. Um, obviously, Kotlin is really of interest to us because in the future we might be able to use like Kotlin code to actually compile to bytecode and compile to native code on uh, iOS and compile, compile to JavaScript on web, which would be amazing because then we don't have to ship uh, duct tape, which is like a JavaScript browser, which we embed in the app. Um, so we use that for like rendering invoices. Invoice to go is a invoice app. Uh, and we use it for uh, very important calculations like taxes and stuff, things you don't want to duplicate three times. Um, but I'm going to talk mostly about Kotlin today. Um, that's all the code that we kind of write for the client side application. The three files for Java, in case you're wondering, are just auto generated unit tests that I still need to have to track down and remove. So what you can also see is that the code base, in my opinion, for Kotlin, like it's the far right number, uh, is not that big. Um, to me, like working with multiple Android apps, I would feel like the, the number would be double if we did the same app in Java. So it's quite, it's quite a compact code base, in my opinion. Uh, so why did we choose Kotlin in the first place? Like this journey started like uh, almost a year ago at invoice to go um, so like mentioned previously, it has great uh, Java interoperability. Uh, it has a very small standard library. Uh, a big thing in Android development is the, the dex count, like the number of methods that you can embed in your app. Uh, it's one of the reasons why Scala really never took off on Android and mobile development. Um, you have to use all Java features on Android, which is painful. Uh, we have to wait a long time before the features become available, and we can drop all platforms. Um, and also, we have great tooling because Android Studio is based on IntelliJ. We have a great plugin. Uh, in addition to that, we use RxJava a lot in our app. And there's also a couple of benefits that are really cool for R RxJava. So you use a lot of lambdas in RxJava. So that makes Kotlin much nicer than Java 6. Um, Extension functions are great as well. Uh, I'll show you an example later on, like how you can use extension functions to kind of bypass certain operators and constructs that you would normally use in Java with RxJava. Um, so I'm just going to list like features and give some examples of how we use them and how you can build like things uh, to make your code nicer. Um, first off, uh, delegation is really something we use heavily in the app uh, at multiple places. So uh, here's an example of uh, property delegation. So in Kotlin, you don't have to uh, like assign something to a property. You can also delegate it to another object. So here we're saying that the val my string is going to be provided by an object that is returned from bind string with a string ID. So this is kind of a nice way how you can hide um, resources boilerplate in Java by just writing a function that returns an implementation that kind of abstracts away all the context lookup things. Um, behind the scenes, basically what bind string returns is just an implementation of a, a read-only property with a get value. So you can see kind of if you create something yourself which uses the context behind the scenes that you can return a string without having to write all the uh, get resources, get string uh, boilerplate. Uh, Another thing that builds on uh, delegation is uh, this notion of laziness. So there's this built-in delegation called lazy where you can pass a lambda which uh, basically creates the, executes the lambda only when you access the property. Uh, so this is really useful if like, the property is really expensive to create. Um, it's heavily used in codeine. We use codeine for our dependency injection. And it has a lot, for every, uh, 
way of injection, it also has a lazy variant. Um, so that's really useful as well. Uh, so the second kind of delegation we use is interface delegation. So what this is, you can have uh, any object that just implements an interface, and then you can say buy and then specify an implementation that provides that interface. And from the outside, it will just look as if that object implements the entire set of methods. But behind the scenes, Kotlin will delegate to this specific interface. So it's really interesting for us where on Android, you have a lot of like features that are not really specific to a screen, like loading dialogues, or if you have a pop-up that shows online or offline messaging, things that are not related to the, the core feature itself on that screen, but come back in every screen. Uh, if, you use prop, well, if you use interface delegation like this, you can reuse that on fragments and activities or plain views. It doesn't really matter. It, it makes us much easier than uh, base classes, for instance, because you would have to re-implement the same thing over and over again. Uh, so at the same time, like this feels a bit like multiple inheritance if you start using it, but it really is not. Um, so you need to like pay attention that uh, the things that you're delegating are actually separate concerns. They're not really related to the class itself, because when you start like trying to pass references around between either the class that delegates and the delegate, or the other way around, it really becomes messy. So for instance, in this case, like in, if you uh, construct a delegate like this, you cannot pass the, in, the reference to the delegating class. It just won't compile because it's not available. This doesn't exist at that time. Uh, so you want to really separate that. And if that's not possible, you really have to think like, mm, maybe I'm actually trying to build a base class and normal inheritance is better. Uh, uh, yeah, or you can instantiate a reusable class inside of the instance. That's another alternative. Another thing we use a lot is uh, the mutability and immutability distinction in Kotlin. Uh, we have kind of our own ORM layer on top of Realm, which is a database. Um, so all our objects are uh, uh, immutable by default. If you query an object, you get an immutable interface back. Uh, and then we define a mutable version of that object as well. Uh, but you can never retrieve the multiple version, the mutable version. So uh, basically it works like this. You have a, a getter on your DAO, which returns a normal document in this case. And if you want to mutate something on a document, we have a special mutate method where you pass in an ID and then uh, a mutation. So this is another really nice feature if you look at the last line uh, where we pass in a lambda. Uh, but this lambda is basically scoped around an instance of a mutable document. So this gives you a really nice uh, notation when you're mutating things. Uh, because here you can assume that the number, the this is basically the mutable document. So it saves a lot of boilerplate and really makes a nice kind of DSL to mutate uh, things. And you can use that for all kinds of things, for builders and, and, and things like that. Uh, this is just an example how we use it to kind of make database interactions nicer. Uh, yeah. So in our app, uh, our whole architecture kind of revolves around a database and a view and has a unidirectional data flow. So you can see we have the view. Uh, there's some action that is triggered from the view, like by pressing a button or inputting something. And then we mutate the state, which in our case is the Realm database. It kind of interfaces as a cache between the network uh, and the view. And then we repopulate the view from the database. So this just goes round and round. And the glue to kind of make that all happen is all in RxJava. Uh, so that's kind of, yep. so it's kind of like pipelines. The pipelines that we create between those components are all uh, observable streams. So I just want to walk back through a quick example of kind of how that looks like and what are the benefits of, of ArxJava. And then we'll look at like what Kotlin brings to the table to kind of make your ArxJava experience really nicely. So suppose we have a presenter and this is kind of, we're gonna build like a, a little tiny dating app screen for like inspired by a famous app where we just uh, present a, a really nice hot person on the screen and two buttons and you can either like this person or flip to the next one. We're gonna do that in a really reactive fashion. 
So we start out with our uh, subscription and we'll get to those at the top. And we have a DAO which basically fetches data and we have some kind of API where we can kind of communicate results uh, to. Um, so when we bind to a view model, um, we basically, the view model here with VM, we have the, the next clicks, which is just a button. Uh, it emits a unit whenever you press it. Uh, we start with the unit because we, we want to show something on the screen. And uh, the switch map basically fetches something from our DAO. So in this case, we'll start with one person and then whenever you click next, we fetch another one. Um, we subscribe to that to render this person onto the screen in a nice fancy picture. And then we have a like button and this like button basically communicates the results to the API. Uh, so we record the like uh, and we connect the whole thing together so that it's, it's functioning. So this is a couple of uh, nice properties. Like for one, we're not managing any state in the presenter. Like there's no field where we keep like a reference to the current person. Um, we don't have any listeners that we kind of have to manage. Everything is glued together in the subscription. So that's a really nice feature of RxJava. But at the same time, because we don't have this state, we kind of have to pass a lot of state in our observable chains. Um, so you can see here that there's a couple of nice uh, notations in uh, Kotlin that make that a lot more pleasant. Like the Lambda notations and the subscribe uh, is really nice. Um, yeah, and uh, I'll get to the destructuring in a bit. So a couple of features here is uh, the Lambda as a, per as a parameter. So normally uh, this is kind of like a, a Java way to write a Lambda as a parameter. Uh, but in Kotlin, you can actually write it like this. So drop, drop, uh, drop the braces. Um, and if you have multiple parameters and the Lambda is the last one, you can actually write it like this. So this is the same mutate method that we saw previously. So if the Lambda is the last one, you can just add it uh, as a block at the end instead of putting it inside of the braces, which is really nice and makes it a lot more readable. Um, another thing that we use a lot, um, like if you write RxJava in, uh, in normal Java code and you want to kind of extend the behavior with your own operators or have reusable chunks of streams, you have this thing called a transformer. And it's basically an object which takes a stream and then outputs another stream by applying uh, a set of operators. So this is a really simple kind of transformer, which is a bit silly. Uh, it just applies one operator, which is take three. And the way you use it is then that you have an observable stream here of integers and we say compose and then you pass in your transformer. In Kotlin, we can do this much nicer because we have extension functions. So in Kotlin, you would write it uh, like this where you basically extend the observable of int. You just give it a name and you say what it outputs and then uh, you can just apply methods on the this because the this is the observable stream. It's much more natural because you don't have to create this artificial wrapper object uh, that you then need to apply to the stream. You can just extend the, th the stream in a, in a natural way. And this is actually so nice that we use it like everywhere in our code, even for like trivial examples. Like here we have a filter where you say, oh, there's a Boolean stream and it's, uh, we filtered the it, which is then true or false. And we just extend that to a filter true and that makes your code a lot more re readable than when you have to figure out like what is it. Like that's kind of a bit uh, weird. Um, so we have all these shorthands that make the RxJava code a lot more uh, readable. Another feature that we use a lot uh, is uh, destructuring. So here you have an example where we pass it. We pass two objects uh, through the stream, like a settings object and a document object. And then we have an operator, but we only care about one object. And with this notation, you can kind of destructure the pair that you're passing and just use one object directly and discard the other one in this particular Lambda. Um, that said, I'm not a big fan of all the destructuring, like IntelliJ kind of tries to encourage you to destructure everything, but in that case, you kind of lose what kind of objects you're using. So. It kind of depends on a case-by-case -case basis if I choose to destructure or not. 
But in Rx Java code, it's really nice. Another thing that's which is kind of controversial and has a bad reputation in Android is reflection. Um, we tend to not use it. We can tend to have like a bit of a aversion to it. But reflection in Kotlin is really nice. Like it's a lot more powerful than what's available in um, Java. So I just want to give like one tiny example of how you can kind of use reflection in a more interesting way uh, because it has a bit more type safety than in Java. So suppose we have a class address, which has a couple of fields, and we have a client, which has an address and a shipping address. Uh, we want to create a screen where we just edit the address and then set it uh, on the place where we want it. And typically what you would do in Java is you create the screen and then you pass in an enum saying, oh, is this a shipping address or is it the client, the normal address? Um, but then you have to create this enum. With a reflection, you can do something kind of neat where you pass in uh, two objects, like the client object and the address object that you want to edit. And then you pass in a property uh, which is typed as an, an address property. And you can say, just put it in this property. Um, so in some cases in our app, we have sections where you can edit like 20 fields, which are all like key value labels. Uh, and instead of having to have a giant enum, which kind of represents all those things, you can just pass in properties, which is kind of nice. Uh, depends on your app if it's worth it to include the reflect library because it's quite big, but I think it's quite neat. Um, so this is how internally you would set the property. Then you just say, oh, this is the target property. You pass the instance of the client and the address. Um, so this is all well and good. Like, is it all happy days in, in Rx or in Kotlin? Um, not really. There's a couple of problems still. Uh, annotation processing is horribly slow, uh, in my opinion. Uh, and I don't, I'm a bit skeptical if that's really going to improve a lot because I think we're always going to be stuck in this kind of two world um, place where you have Java code that generates, uh, has a Java annotation processor which outputs Java code and then you have Kotlin code which generates Kotlin code and you always have to like call Java compile, call Kotlin compile, call Java compile again and then call Kotlin compile again. So it's kind of annoying. Um, I hope it's going to get better, but I can imagine it's always going to be tricky. So my advice would be try to kind of lo localize annotation processing in small modules um, so that at least either Gradle can completely avoid uh, doing the annotation processing if you didn't change anything, or at least it's going to be fast because it's a small module. The other thing is that since recently Kotlin has a uh, compiler daemon as well, which eats up a lot of memory. So if you do a lot of uh, Android development, you know that you kind of have to set the Gradle daemon to a gigantic amount of memory to kind of to be able to dex and uh, build your whole APK. Uh, now you have to account for another couple of gigabytes for this Kotlin compiler. And you kind of notice that 16 gigabytes is just not enough anymore. If you're running an emulator and you're running Android Studio and you have a browser and then you have to these two daemons, you're just running like 21, 22 gigabytes and you're just swapping all the time. Um, so it would be really nice to have like bigger MacBooks or to just buy a Dell or something. Um, they have a 32 gigabyte model. That's really nice. Last thing, ProGuard can be tricky. Don't leave it until last. Um, Kotlin kind of generates these synthetic properties uh, with references inside of the bytecode and then ProGuard happily strips them out and then everything gets confused. So you sometimes have to deal with code that you didn't write that's just generated behind the scenes but it gets stripped out by ProGuard. Um, so my advice would be try to run it as early as possible in your project so at least you're not like stressing out at the last day if you do it like two days before launch and you have some time to test it so that uh, it doesn't blow up in your face. Um, yeah. So yeah, that was a bit of a tour of what we use. I hope it was useful. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Yeah. Ah, we use that as well. Yeah. Yeah, it just, uh, well, like Rx Kotlin only provides you a couple of nice syntactic wrappers around Rx Java. 
So you still need to use Arcs Java included as a base library. Uh, but like, my, I think the automatic mapping already gives you a lot out of the box of Kotlin. So like, there's not much in Rx Kotlin that really provides you. And in the near future, are you willing to switch with the coroutines, or are you still going to stick with the Rx Java? Um, so we haven't used coroutines at all. And I think also coroutines, while they are interesting, if you use Rx Java, it doesn't play nice with Rx Java. In general, like frameworks that use their own threading internally don't play nicely with RxJava and the threading of RxJava. So I don't see us actually using it at all. Um, for an example, like uh, Realm has a lot of threading uh, rules inside as well, and that's just painful. So uh, yeah. <laughs> 